My guest is now on the line. Let's go over and say hello to Gerald Salante. Nice to have you with us, Gerald. Gerald, what I want to do today is I want to go through a series of commentaries, short ones, on topics that are not getting the attention. I'd like you to give us your short feedback on each one. Okay. All right. I just gave you our first one, our failed war on drugs. Well, it's obvious, and um, it's part of the whole uh, military security complex. And it's in, and it, as you kept pointing out, all the breaches of our uh, human rights and dignity by the police and others. It's just a, it's just another part of the whole construct of what's happened to America. Whether it's wire, you know, warrantless wiretapping, wars on drugs, it's a militaristic society, and they all end in failures. It's not only the war on drugs; it's the wars overseas. It's the wars on everything. So, and again, and when you when you're talking about these issues, um, for example, with every state now, uh, Governor Cuomo making a statement today about gun control. Uh, there, there's virtually no talk at all about the psychotropic drugs that these people have been on. If you want to talk about a war on drugs and uh, that these, so many of these mass murderers are, are whacked out on. And when you look at the trend line for these violent crimes, these mass murders being committed, uh, they follow a perfect trend line of when all these psychotropic drugs have been being used and, and pushed into the brains of these, these people that are unstable to begin with. So the war on drugs is just another failure among all the other wars being fought. All right, let's go on to another one. We're going to try to keep our answers short because we have so many things sure. to handle here. This is from Richard Clark from Op-Ed News, and he says... Is our economy being artificially maintained and propped up? If so, how and why? I'll just, I'm not going to go through it. I'm just going to give you the, um, the titles. Superfluous goods sector jobs. It's not just that the official unemployment numbers are a fraud. Most of the actual numbers are in some important sense fake as well. Ask yourself how many workers today actually produce something of core value. And then understand that 80% of all the jobs in the United States could disappear tomorrow. And if, if uh, And if it were the right 80% of them, it wouldn't affect basic human survival or happiness in the least, provided everyone had enough money to buy the products and services that were still being produced, products like food staples and basic housing, services like basic health care, education, and public transport and utilities. Yes, in our society, we need money to survive, and jobs provide that money, but that doesn't mean that any and every job necessarily provides any core benefit and then when I took a look at the actual statistics, I found out that most of the new jobs came because the holiday season and because these were short-term workers brought in at low wages to work in retail outlets. And now that these uh, holiday season's over, they're going to go away. And we bear, the actual unemployment rate in the United States, if we're honest, is about 23%. And yet we're not being told the truth. Why can't we be told the truth about it? The fact that we have a 23% unemployment rate instead of this artificial nonsense of 7.8. Of course, they lie about everything. They never tell the truth. <laughs> How about Saddam Hussein having weapons of mass destruction and ties al Qaeda? Whether they ever tell the truth? And and John, that's John uh, William Shadow's stats, which I urge everybody to look at. He really has the best numbers out there. And again, it's it's very important to look at this globally. And the only, the only reason the economies are being propped up, and you even could pick up today's Wall Street Journal, you name the country, even Switzerland, that used to be, you know, the, the benchmark for a st for smart economic uh, fundamentals in running an economy, are printing money. The new the new head of the Bank of Japan, uh, the Prime Minister of Japan, Abe, he's employed the Bank of Japan to print money. Every country out there is printing endless streams of money at virtually no interest rates going to the banks. That's the only thing that's propping this up. And yes, the jobs are not the kind of jobs that are producing either goods or futures for the people that have them. Did you see the um, interview between Alex Jones and uh, Pierce Morgan on CNN Monday night? Yes, I did. Okay. I believe that Alex would have been a lot more effective had he not 
hit that third rail of going from outrage to rage. But if you listen to what he actually said for many of his points, it's worth noting. I sent Pierce Morton, uh, Morgan today documentation, specific and scholarly documentation that would withstand any uh, court cross-examination of the person's name, their medications they were on, psychiatric medications, how many people they injured or killed, uh, when they did this, where they did this. So there are, we have hundreds and hundreds of these cases. And yet, when we talk about violence in the United States, we only think about gun violence. And then suddenly it becomes, uh, we have to get a greater handle on gun violence. Why can't we also discuss other aspects of this? Not that we shouldn't have open and honest discussions about guns. We should. But this is something from Sleuth Journal. U.S. takes the lead in killing of children. Quote, Over the last ten years, four times more children died in the United States from domestic violence than soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan during the war. This is the worst death rate in the developed nation. This means the myth that adopted children would be better off in the United States than in Russia is doubtful. In addition, no one knows what awaits these children in the United States. In December, the U.S. organization Child Help that helps children affected by violence released a new report. The authors of the report wrote about, quote, hidden epidemic of child abuse in the United States. Annually, 3.3 million reports of violence. Over about 6 million children are received. Every day in the United States, more than five children die for reasons related to violence. The authors of this study conclude the U.S. set the worst record in all developed countries in the world. The most widespread child abuse is neglect of their lives and interest, 78.3%, followed by physical violence, 17.6%, sexual violence, 9.2%, and psychological violence, 8.1%. Over 80% of the children who died of violence were under four years of age. In approximately 6% of the cases, death certificates did not specify that the cause of death was abuse. And then it went on to talk about more. So, on the one hand, we do not acknowledge or recognize that we are a violent nation. So here we have some statistics that no one has talked about. 3.3 million reports of violence on 6 million children. That's an epidemic. Those are serious numbers. Separately, 75% of all gun violence is with gangs. Now, we it was four years ago when you were on the program that you and I predicted that there would be a boom in the gangs because of the economy and young people being unemployed or disenfranchised and wanting to protect what they have or help their parents, they would join gangs because of gangs offered them a sense of community. Gangs gave them food and protection. Gangs stopped them from being bullied. But also then the gangs extracted loyalty, and then they became a part of their criminal operations. And violence is generally one of the mainstays against others of how gangs spread. Now the FBI report shows 1.4 million gang members, a 40% increase, in just the last three years, and I'm predicting that it's going to double. We're going to have three million gang members, which means there won't be a single safe place in the United States free of gang influence. And gangs, the poorer it gets, the more stressed the economy, the more unemployment, they're going to increase. And yet not a word about gang violence, and the gangs have no problem getting any weapon they want. And what are they going to do about gang violence? So thus far, two, three things are off the table. No discussion about the fact that every single killer of in these mass homicides has been on psychiatric meds. Gang no, violence you're right. Gang violence is seventy five percent and no effort to deal with gangs or the underlying reasons people join gangs, poverty and opportunity. No discussion of actual childhood violence. You see if you narrow like the people in Congress who are really idiots. But if they narrow the discussion to the talking points have to be register guns, not register guns, have uh, only hang guns or, or get rid of the semi-automatics, that misses the whole larger argument. Are we a violent nation? If you take away just people who are killed and you look at people abused by violence, then you see that more people were killed by hammers and knives and bats. 
So are you going to ban knives, hammers, and bats? And what about the kids who under four who are abused by fists? Are you going to register and, and, and ban fists? The, the insanity of how they're going about this, they're not even knowing which questions to ask. So I've given you three areas where we're extraordinarily violent, where we're not dealing with psychotropic drugs as a cause of violence because a person literally loses their sense of a mental uh, capacity, gang violence, which is epidemic, and physical abuse, mental abuse, and neglectful abuse leading to abuse that is killing children in the United States. Your thoughts? We have a culture of cruelty. And, you know, the, to me, the fish rots from the head down. And why shouldn't why shouldn't other people be violent if the presidents and and the politicians extol violence and even brag about it? And you you heard Hillary Clinton after they uh, after Gaddafi was dead that famous clip out there we say we came we we saw we came or something he died and she starts laughing and so does the host. And then, you know, now President Obama has just announced his new selection for the CIA head, and he's uh, one of the prime architects of drones away, killing suspected terrorists believed to be militants and any collateral damage around them. No one cares. How many people were killed in Iraq? You know, how much depleted uranium was dropped? How about the ongoing war going on in, in Afghanistan? And I mentioned Libya, and now we're going into Syria. It's a culture of violence. Turn on the TV. It's a culture of violence. Watch Hollywood. It's a culture of violence. Watch the video games. It's a culture of violence. It's a culture of cruelty. And that's really, to me, what it is, more than violence. It's cruelty. How about, I have a good name for you. How about enhanced interrogation techniques? Let's not call it torture. Look what they're doing to this to this poor guy, Bradley Manning, this this kid. Yeah, it's a culture of cruelty. Okay. Got, so got, on, on, I'm sorry. Go on. No, we got the point. You 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 nailed it. All right, but we're not willing to look at the real underlying causes of violence. Instead, we have politicized the issue to a point where we leave off the table for discussion and change that which could really make a difference. Uh, econ- econ- economic uh, economic opportunity, educational opportunity uh, dec- uh, for those who are now deprived of that, and that's going to lead to an unhappy outcome for most of them. Next up, from Naomi Wolf from The Guardian, revealed how the FBI coordinated the crackdown on Occupy. I'll just read the first paragraph. It was more sophisticated than we had imagined. New documents show that the violent crackdown on Occupy last fall, so mystifying at the time, was not just coordinated at the level of the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security and local police. The crackdown, which involved, as you may recall, violent arrests, group disruption, canister missiles to the skulls of protesters, people held in handcuffs so tight that they were injured, people held in bondage till they were forced to wet or soil themselves, was coordinated with the big banks themselves. The Partnership for Civil Justice Fund, in a groundbreaking scoop that should once more shame U.S. major media outlets, uh, filed this request. The document reproduced uh, on their site shows a terrifying network coordinated Department of Homeland Security, FBI, police, regional fusion centers, and private sector activities so completely merged into one another that the monstrous whole is in fact one entity, in some cases bearing a single name, the Domestic Security Alliance Council, and it reveals this merged entity to have one centrally planned, locally executed mission. The documents, in short, show the cops and Department of Homeland Security working with big banks to target, arrest, and politically disable peaceful American citizens. The documents released after a long delay in the week between Christmas and New Year show a nationwide meta plot unfolding in city after city in an Orwellian world. Six American universities are sites where campus police funneled information about students involved in the Occupy Wall Street effort to the FBI. With the administration's knowledge, banks sat down with the FBI officials to pull information about Occupy Wall Street protesters harvested by private security groups 
plans to crush Occupy events, plans for a month down the road, were made by the FBI and offered to the representatives of the same organizations that the protesters would target, and even threats of assassination of Occupy Wall Street leaders by sniper fire, by whom, where, now remain redacted. So they actually, the FBI, Homeland Security, and the big banks had targeted people for assassination. And this is all right there. Where is the outrage anywhere in the United States? On every single college campus, everywhere there was an Occupy movement, they were being cataloged as terrorists. Now they're on terrorist list. Every single person. They were all photographed, retinal scans. They were infiltrated. Every meeting they had, they had provocateurs and and, uh, people in the meetings. Now we find this out. But that's also true for all peaceful demonstration in the United States. Where is the, where is, well, we know where the real left is. They're conscientious. But now it should show how mockingly disdainful the corporate left is when it comes to saying we're with you and they were part of the problem. Your thoughts? You know, I've said this probably on your show back in 2008 without going through all of that uh, in, in what you said that the um, the private sector working with the with the government with the police the FBI and the, and the, and, and, uh, and other government agencies it's called the merger of state and corporate powers and people get kept, kept keep getting caught up in trying to redefine the definition by putting wrong terms into it it's called fascism the merger of state and corporate powers. What can anyone expect? It's as old as Mussolini and before. And it's happening here. It's called four words. Too big to fail. Washington is Wall Street. Wall Street is Washington. You talked about uh, uh, Alex Jones on Piers Morgan. And he started, you know, going on about a new world order. And then, of course, everybody, oh, what world new? So you're conspiracy theorists. It's not a conspiracy. There is a new world order. It's called a banking order. And the banking order, it's not only in the United States. It's worldwide. Look what's going on in Europe. Look what, how they're beating up the people. Look at the poverty. The new numbers just came out in Spain, Italy, and Greece. Between those three countries, the unemployment rate for young adults, for people under 35 years old, actually, is, is between 30 and 50 percent. They still call it a recession. In Greece, in Spain, the unemployment rates are 27 percent officially. And they call it a recession. So, Gary, this is what happens when societies break down, and, and these societies are being they're broken down by the banks. And so, this is a fascist society. The behavior is indicative to the disease. All right. Now, this to follow up on what you just said. This is from Matt Tabibi in Rolling Stone. And it's an article just today, and it says, Secrets and Lies of the Wall Street Bailout. The federal rescue of Wall Street did not fix the economy. It created a permanent bailout state based upon a Ponzi-like confidence scheme, and the worst may yet to come. Let me quote his first two paragraphs. It has been four long winters since the federal government, in the hulking, shaven, scald, alienationesque form of then Secretary of Treasury Hank Paulson committed seven hundred billion in taxpayer money to rescue Wall Street from its own shenanery and greed. To listen to the bankers and their allies in Washington tell it, you'd think the bailout was the best thing to hit the American economy since the invention of the assembly line. Not only did it prevent another Great Depression, we've been told, but the money has been paid back, all of it, and the government even made a profit. No harm, no fool, right? Wrong. It's all a lie, one of the biggest, most elaborate falsehoods ever sold to the American people. We were told that the taxpayer was stepping in only temporarily, mind you, to prop up the economy and save the world from financial catastrophe. What we actually ended up doing was the exact opposite. We're committing American taxpayer to permanent, blind support of an ungovernable, unregulatable, 
hyper-concentrated new financial system that exacerbates the greed and inequality that caused the crash and forces Wall Street banks like Goldman Sachs and Citigroup to increase risk rather than reduce it. The result is one of those deals where one wrong decision early on blossoms into a lush nightmare of unintended consequences. We thought we were just letting a few uh, friend, uh, a, a friend crash at the house for a few days. We ended up with a family of hillbillies who moved in forever, sleeping nine in a bed and building a meth lab in the front lawn. But the most appalling part is the lying. The public has been lied to shamelessly and so often in the course of the past four years that the failure to tell the truth to the general populace has become a kind of a baked-in official feature of the financial rescue. Money wasn't the only thing the government gave Wall Street. It also conferred the right to hide the truth from the rest of us. And it was all done in the name of helping regular people create jobs. It is, says former bailout Inspector General Neil Barofsky, the ultimate bait and switch. The bailout deceptions came early, late, and in between. There were lies told in the first moments of their inception and others still being told four years later. The lies, in fact, were the most important mechanisms of the bailout. The only reason investors haven't run screaming from an obviously corrupt financial marketplace is because the government has gone to such extraordinary lengths to sell the narrative that the problems of 2008 have been fixed. Investors may not actually believe the lie, but they are impressed by how totally committed the government has been from the very beginning to selling it. Today, what few remember about the ballots is what we had uh, had to approve then. Anyhow, it's a long article, and it's a well-done article, and I commend uh, Matt on it. Your thoughts about the fact that virtually all of the Wall Street firms were lying, they are all corrupt, they have engaged in nothing but corrupt illegal practices, with a full cooperation of both Republicans and Democrats, with Treasury Secretaries, with the head of the Federal Reserve. It's one giant cesspool, and no one has the power to change it at this time. Your thoughts? Well, there is people have the power to change it. It's just not the people in power that are going to change it. That's what have, I meant. That's, that's yeah, what I meant. You don't have the Bananos or Gambinos to go straight. And that's all the Republicans and the Democrats are. And why, again, you know, I can, I just pulled up a piece that we did. This is September 15, 2009. No cover up, no recovery. It's a you know, cover up, not recovery. It's just a cover up. And, and you want to talk about, you want to talk about scandals and how corrupt it all is? How about this one? L I B O R. No one's talking about the LIBOR rates. So, you know, the interest rates that everybody has to pay that have been fixed by the major banks around the world. That's right, fixed. The game is totally rigged. And according to the emails, our now uh, Treasury Secretary, Timothy Geithner, he knew about it. Mervyn King over there in England, they knew about it back in 2008, 2009. It's, it's a corrupt system from top to bottom. And you want to talk about nobody going to jail, nobody doing any time? You didn't see one head roll under the Obama administration. For, you know, when he went over to Wall Street, you know, the reckless behavior, you know, unchecked ex- excess is at the heart of the crisis, he said. We can be confident that the storms of the past two years are beginning to break. He said that in September of 2009. And, and then again, I could take it personally. My money was stolen from me by John Corzine, the former senator and governor of New Jersey. John Corzine, the former head of the Goldman Sachs gang. That's right. Also the head of MF Global. They went into segregated accounts. I had my money in a segregated account. He went in and stole it because to satisfy his bad gambling habit. Do you see his head roll? He's not even being qu- called up for questioning by the, by the authorities. Oh, and by the way, you know who runs the Commodities Future Trading Commission? Yeah, Gary Gensler. Where did he come from? Uh, didn't he work with the uh, Corzine at the Goldman Sachs gang? It's one big club. 
Who was the guy, Gary, that that destroyed the Glass Steagall Act that was put in place during the Great Depression? Bill Clinton. Depression. There were four people. Bill Clinton authorized it because he's always been on the inside track of getting the handout. You had uh, Rubin, who was Secretary of the Treasury. You had a uh, Texas uh, Republican, who was uh, the biggest advocate within the uh, Congress on this. And Larry Summers was an advisor on it. All right. Now, where did, where did uh, Rubin come from, Gary? Goldman Sachs. He was the president right. of Goldman Sachs. That's right. Who's the head of the European Central Bank? Mario Draghi. A former he, chairman of Goldman Sachs, president of Goldman Sachs, one of the top executives of Goldman right. Sachs. Right, vice chairman, vice vice chairman. Of, yeah. of the European division. Yes. Three Card Monty over there in Italy, international yes. advisor for Goldman Sachs. Who's the new head of the Bank of, of, of England? Um, also from Goldman Sachs. Mark Carney, that's yes. right. Yes. I mean, what, what a surprise. I mean, why, I mean why, why keep this game going? That's a cartel, all right? That's it's a cabal. The, it's the new world order. That's correct. It's the banking order. I agree. All right, and one more thing here. By the way, I am going to take some calls. In Our normal program is 55 minutes. At the end of that 55 minutes, we will extend this with Gerald, and you'll have a chance to share your points of view on TalkBack at 888-874-4888, 888-874-4888. And for those of you who will not be able to listen to it because your station will be at the end of the 55-minute program, you can use the telephone uh, at 832-280-0066, 832-280-0066, anywhere in America, in Canada, you can use that and hear the program. And by the way, we just got a letter today, and uh, you'll find this interesting, um, uh, Gerald. So many people are using the phone to listen to the show now that we're number one in all of America of all the stations using it. Uh, and I think we just crossed the line of three million uh, minutes there. So. A lot of people are using this technology. Now, Gerald, next, uh, t- and oh, let me also mention before I forget that this Sunday noon, I'll be having a, a discussion, not a lecture, on homesteading. People actually want to be considered and interviewed for homesteading positions. You'll call 646-926-5422 for that. Gerald, next up, and this is about... The former advisor, Obama, as, quote, ruthless and indifferent to rule of law as Bush, from Beth Brogan, staff writer for Common Dreams, quote, a former security advisor for Barack Obama now says the president's Pentagon's targeted drone program is counterproductive, is, quote, encouraging a new arms race, and has killed far more civilians than has been acknowledged. And this was in the current edition of International Affairs. Michael Doyle, a LaSalle University expert on counterterrorism, who served as Obama's campaign counterterrorism expert, uh, is now coming out and saying that he's just as ruthless and just as indifferent, quote, quote to the rule of law as his predecessor, and uh, they're killing a lot more people than what they're being honest about. Your thoughts on these drones and our war on terror? Well, again, you know, it's, it's everybody knows it. And nobody wants to talk about it. You know, these are extrajudicial killings. When you read the language of these drone strikes, you know, 10 militants were killed. And they always live in compounds, by the way. You know, they never live in houses. They're always compounds. And, and, and it's against international law. And that's what I keep saying, Gary. It's a culture of cruelty. They're allowed to get away with it. And then with the United States, with its great hypocrisy, denounces other nations for the atrocities that they commit. So it's it's just going on like this, and it's becoming more violent. And here's what I'm concerned about. Just as no one is stopping this from happening, my greatest concern right now, and it's going to be finishing up the top trends of this year with the the, the magazines coming out, is war. And and they're going to take us to war. And, And I'm afraid that the next war is going to be in Syria. Okay, but hold, hold, your, hold your thoughts, because we're at the yep. end of this program, and I'm going to say goodbye to our stations and thank everyone for listening. We're going to continue on with Gerald Salante over Progressive Radio Network or the phone number I gave you, 832-280-0066. Now, there's a major report. I was going to talk to, with you about this, about the truth behind our actions and, and behind the scenes in Syria. We've planned 
on this uh, incursion, this civil war in Syria, because it suited our needs to have Syria taken out of the pictures, being a supporter of Iran and uh, uh, physically beside Iran, so that it would give a better position for the United States and Israel against Iran. Your thoughts? Oh, well, exactly. I mean, we were writing about this, you know, for two years now, when when the, when the so-called Arab Spring first began to break out. It's exactly why. And also that Syria and Libya were the only bases where Russia and China had access into the Mediterranean. It was the only places they were going. And so with Syria out of the way, then Iran is next. And there's also another very important note into this. As a matter of fact, if people go to my website, uh, trendsjournal.com, and go to my media blog, there's an interview with me and the, um, the bureau chief from Al Jazeera, uh, Washington bureau chief, prior to the United States humanitarian mission in, in uh, Libya, so-called humanitarian mission. This guy goes off the charts when I call him out. Anyway, because it's all ties together, because you're talking about why doesn't the media do this, why doesn't the media do that. As you well know, uh, Al Gore just scored $100 million by selling his current TV cable station, of which nobody was watching, 42,000 viewers at a high spot. Uh, each night on, the, on on a show, given show. So who bought it? Al Jazeera. Who owns Al Jazeera? The Qatar government. Members of the Arab League. The same Qatar government that was funneling all of the arms, along with Saudi Arabia, into Libya with the acquiescence of the United States and destabilized that area. The same Qatar government that is behind the Syrian revolution, of which you keep seeing over and over again. It's the same kind of Islamic group, groups that are the, the radical fringe. And now, and now they are going to have their voice in America. Isn't that nice? So when you put all these pieces together, it's a continuation of the United States trying to gain more and more control over the oil-rich, resource-rich Middle East. One last thought on this from Chris Hedges, State of Fear, from truthdig.com. Quote, Shannon um, Mecklish of Florida is a 45-year-old mother of two children. She is a homemaker, a taxpayer, and a safe driver. She votes in every election. She attends a Unitarian church on Sundays. She is also, like nearly all who have a relationship with the Occupy movement in the United States being monitored by the federal government. She knows this because she's read FBI documents obtained by the Partnership for Civil Justice Fund through the Freedom of Information Act. She was startled to see a redaction that could only be referring to her. Her story is the story of hundreds of thousands of people, perhaps more, whose lives are being invaded by the state. It is the story of a security and surveillance apparatus overseen by the executive branch under Barack Obama that has empowered the FBI and Department of Homeland Security to silence the voices and obstruct the activity of citizens who question corporate power. And uh, so here we have it, and it's a good article by Chris, and I recommend people read it, but we are living in a state of fear in the United States. For many people who have consciousness, they know that if they protest, if they go against corporate rule or the government, they will be they will become on someone's watch list. And then on top of that we have today Congress is less popular than cockroaches and Genghis Khan. Quote Yeah, true. This is true. A little of uh, the little of US Congress fresh off its fiscal cliff budget is now less popular than cockroaches and lice. The public policy polling surveyed eight hundred and thirty Americans and revealed that Congress has hit new lows in the eyes of the same US voters who sent representatives to work. Um, the legislative body proved less popular than traffic jams, Donald Trump, France, lice, Genghis Khan, cockroaches, and used car dealers, the poll found. So how is it that on the one hand we are a nation of fear, on the other hand we are a nation of bread and circuses to distract us from the pain and angst of a surrealistic existence? Your thoughts? It's people who won't let go of their belief systems. And they still, even though they say that, they believe in others. You know, re politics in America is like a religion. And you know me, I'm a political atheist. I don't believe in political religions. And when you tell somebody that you don't, you know, agree with their political religion and, and they can't proselytize you, they get really tight and angry about it. 
So on one hand, the people are saying that, but on the other hand, they're afraid to let go of their belief system, and that's why they keep tolerating it, I believe. And the other one is, and I keep saying this over and over again, and, and, and it's talking to you and the people listening, it's preaching to the choir, because you, you understand that it's, it's, it's physical, emotional, and spiritual. It's all of those elements have to be put into place in the individual before things change. And people, until people change themselves and reach the highest level within them that they could attain and bring that special gift that they have to its, to its maximum point of efficiency and effectiveness, then nothing changes. So right now it's become, as I said, you know, it's a, the, the culture is too complacent. Just two thoughts. Um, we're we're going to take a call here. Uh, Texas school can force teenagers to wear a locator chip. Uh, the judge says from Reuters, quote, San Antonio, a public school district in Texas, can require students to wear locator chips when they are on school property. Federal judge rule. They're being fought on this by uh, by the American Silver, Civil Liberties Union. But years ago, we would never have thought that school kids would be off, uh, forced to wear these ra- uh, radio frequency identifications or the RFID uh, because we didn't consider the children should be monitored that way, and yet now that is the rule, and let's see how that goes. Uh, I want to finish up with you today, Gerald, by getting your look at three areas in real brief. One, what do you see happening for the average American, and that means the professional class, the working class, the, um, the underpaid working class, the poor in the United States over the next 12 months? Work longer, work harder, and get less. And again, when you look at this so-called fiscal cliff drama, what, who was the one that paid? People paid. You know, we have to pay more Social Security tax. So it, it, it's, uh, it, it's the game is rigged. Do you see the value of our currency being affected, gold, silver, based upon any of the things that are happening in the world today? Gold prices should be much higher than they are. As you mentioned at the top of the show, every nation virtually is devaluing their currency by printing more of it. The more you print, the less it's worth. Gold prices should continue to go up. My economic forecast in, in, a, in a sentence, more of the same but worse.